And in Luke chapter 1, when that passage says that in the sixth month with her, the angel came to, to, uh, to Mary, that was in the sixth month of, of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Uh, some people email me and ask me, says, well, why, is, why isn't it the sixth month of, of the year? Because you can read the verses right before it, talk about the, the, the dating is the pregnancy of Elizabeth, not the year of the calendar. So it's in the six, that's why you know that John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. But Jesus was, was conceived sometime in late December, probably around the 22nd to the 25th on our calendar, and which means he's born in late September, early October. And there are a lot of feast days in Israel's program that that corresponds with and so forth. But my point tonight is that, that the real issue in Christmas, <coughs> I'm sorry, in, in the incarnation of Christ, is, is his conception, not his nativity. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't just the, the birth was completely and totally natural. The thing that was miraculous was the fact that the Word became flesh. He took on our humanity, and that took place at the conception. Hosea chapter 6 is, is, is an interesting verse in, in, in line with that. We talked last time about uh, verse number 2 and 3. Uh, uh, verse number 1, he says, Come and let us return unto the Lord. He has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and the third day he shall raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is, is prepared as the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain under the earth. And we went over this passage last week and the last couple of times. Talk, this is about the second advent of Christ. Not his first coming, but his second coming. And when he says in verse 3 that, that his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain. We talked with you last time about the flight path of, of, of Christ in his, in his second coming and went over a bunch of the details of that kind of stuff, how, how he comes down the Mediterranean coast, goes down into Sinai, comes back up around the western side of the Sea of Galilee, crosses the Jordan River, goes into Mount, uh, Mount of Olives, into Jerusalem, and then back out of there up into the Valley of Decision, Valley of Megiddo for the uh, final Battle of Armageddon and so forth. There's a tremendous uh, 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 battle that goes on there, covers the two day, the third day is when the thing is finally resolved. That's what this is talking about. And all those details about the second coming of Christ, most of the prophetic scripture focuses on his second coming. And there's, there's something that you need to think about, because when he says in verse n number 3, he shall come unto us, that's talking about his second coming. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the surest guarantees that his second coming is, is a factual event of future history is the fact that his first coming was a fact of who, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we had Chinese food a little while ago, and a piece of rice is stuck in my vocal cords. <coughs> the, um, the, the, the first coming is a fact uh, of actual historical reality. And the, the fact that the first coming was, was prophesied and, and, and it was fulfilled in exact detail demonstrates to you that the prophecies about the second coming are just as real and accurate. Uh, go back with me, if you will, to Zechariah chapter number 9. And I just want you to look at some of the things about the, about the first coming of Christ so that you can see the timing and the, spe the specificity and the trustworthiness of the predictions about the first coming demonstrate that the same prophets that make the predictions about the second coming are, have, uh, have a historical record of validation that means you can trust them. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Now here he is, coming, just like we've read in Hosea. But notice, he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon the colt, a colt, the foal of an ass. There is his coming, not in power and great glory, which is what happens at the second advent. Here's his coming, the meek and lowly coming. That's his first coming. Now, when he came, he came at a specific time. He came to a specific place, and he came with, 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 with about 300 specific details about his coming. You remember in Matthew chapter 2 when, when the... Uh, uh, the wise men, come back with me to Daniel chapter 9. When the wise men came, 
They said, we've seen his star in the east, and we've come to, to worship him. They, there, was a, there was people in Jerusalem, Simeon and Anna and so forth, in expectation. There, the, the timing had come to the place in, in the prophetic time schedule where the Messiah was to, was to arrive. There was a, there's a timing in prophecy that set forth a time when the Messiah would appear meek and lowly. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street should be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Well, his cutting off, but not for himself, he's going to have to appear before the cutting off. But when does he appear? He appears at the, at the end of, well, he appears after seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's the, the uh, 483 week, years of the 490 years of Daniel. My point here is not to teach this passage so much as just to point out that there is a timing schedule in expectation here. And when you, when you see the timing uh, that the Scripture says he's going to come in, you're in Daniel, come over with me to Zechariah chapter number 11. Zechariah chapter 11. There, there, there's some really, if you're going to understand the book of Daniel, and you're going to understand the book of the Revelation, you have to put between them the book of Zechariah. Because the book of, you have Daniel here and Revelation here, and Zechariah is sort of like the bridge that bridges between them. In Zechariah chapter 11, you have a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And it says in verse number 12, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. Now you, you remember in Matthew, when Judas betrays Christ, he gets how many pieces of silver? Thirty pieces of silver. By the way, in Exodus chapter 21, if you had a slave that died, somebody killed him, you know how much you had to pay for that slave? Reimburse him? Thirty pieces of silver. They're going to they're gonna pay for, for Christ basically the price of a dead slave. Now, Judas fulfills this, Matthew 27. Now notice the next verse. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it, that is the, the price, unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter, where? In the house of the Lord. Now for that prophet, prophecy to be fulfilled, the temple has to be standing. You got that? In 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed, and from then till now there hasn't been one. That, that, my point to you is a passage like that tells you there's a time frame in which this had to take place. It had to be fulfilled before the seventh week of Daniel. It had to be fulfilled after. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi are post-exile prophets. They've gone back. Ezra and Nehemiah, they go back out of the captivity to Jerusalem. They rebuild the temple. Now they've got the temple rebuilt. That temple lasts until 70 A.D. It's got to be during that period of time. Come back with me to Psalm 118. When Jesus Christ goes down off the, uh, into Jerusalem on that donkey that Malachi, that Zechariah 9 is, is talking about, when he fulfills that, that prophecy, one of, the, one of the passages that is quoted at that time is Psalm 118, verse number. 26, and they cry, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's Matthew 21. But look at the rest of that verse. 
We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Now, that prophecy had to be fulfilled while the house of the Lord is standing for them to do that. So they're, they're, there's, they know it, 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 after, it's got to be before 70 A.D. because then there isn't any temple for them to be blessed in. So you've got this window for these prophecies to be fulfilled in. Come with me to Micah chapter number 5. It gets harder than that, but it, that's hard enough. Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. Start in verse 1. Now gather thyself, O troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. That's his first coming. That's when he came meek and lowly. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the, the, the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in, in, in Israel whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, Micah wrote that 700 years before Christ came. And he said he's gonna, his, his coming forth is going to be from the city of Bethlehem, and he calls it Bethlehem Ephratah. Ephratah is, is sort of like we, we would say we're in Rolling Meadows in Cook County. Uh, there, there's more than one Bethlehem in Israel. And he's identifying this one. It's the, it's the less significant of, of, of the group. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. In other words, 700 years before the time of Christ, Micah said, here's the place. Zechariah uh, 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 says it's going to take place in this time frame. Daniel says, here's the time frame. So you've got a time frame in which it has to take place. You've got a location specifically identified, and you have specific details about what he's going to do. And he fulfills all of those things. Come, come, come back with me, if you will, to, the, to Galatians. And just, just look at some of these things that, that are just... Sometimes you just kind of run by these things, but you, 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 when you begin to list them up, get Galatians chapter 4 in one hand and, and, and Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. Genesis 3, 15. Start in verse 14. Now this is after the fall. Adam and Eve have sinned. God's come and confronted them about their sin. He's told Eve what's going to happen to her or and Adam and so forth. And now he, he's beginning to talk to he, these verses. He's going to talk to Satan about about what's, what, what's coming. Genesis 3, 14, the, the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, that is what in, in, in theology is called the proto-evangel. That's the first time God has explained to man how he's going to work to redeem man. The first good news. But you notice how when he says, there's a redeemer coming. He's going to get rid of Satan. He identifies it as the seed of the woman. Now, that's an interesting title. If, it, if the Messiah is going to be the seed of the woman, there's a man and a woman standing in front of, 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 of the Lord right here. And if it says it's going to be the seed of the woman, who did he leave out? He left out half the human race. <laughs> did you ever hear the, hear the question about what's the greatest sermon ever preached? Some preachers said the greatest sermon ever preached was preached by Satan to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said he preached to half of the human race. He converted his whole audience, and his audience went out and converted the other half of the human race. <laughs> now, that's a pretty effective message. The Messiah 
is going to come, the Redeemer is going to come, but half of the human race is eliminated in the first promise. Galatians chapter 4, this, that's why Galatians 4 verse 4 says what it does. And when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law. Now, He took upon Him the seed of Abraham. He took upon Him our humanity. He took upon Him our flesh. But He did it in a specific, special way. So the first promise was that He would, he would be of the seed, that He would be made of a woman. That's where the virgin birth comes in. That's what the, that, and that's why Paul says what he does here. Come with me. You're, you're in Galatians. Come over to Hebrews chapter number 2. Not only was it going to be, come from, be made of a woman, the seed of the woman, he's going to be a, a certain segment of humanity. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. For verily he took not on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed, not of the woman here, but the seed of Abraham. And if you go back to Genesis chapter number 10, 9, 10, and 11, and 12, what you find is that the seed of the woman is reduced down, of course, with, the, with Noah, and then Noah's three sons. And then he takes one of those sons, Shem, and he has, and one of Shem's descendants is Abraham. And so what God is doing is he's, he's narrowing down the seed line. And that seed of the woman now becomes the seed of Abraham. All the other families, tribes, and nations in the earth have been rejected. And it will only be the seed of Abraham through whom the Messiah can come. So it isn't like we just can go out here and look for anybody born in Bethlehem. Anybody born before the temple is destroyed, you got to find somebody. It, it wasn't going to be just, it had to be of the seed of Abraham. But not just of the seed of Abraham. Look back at Acts chapter number 13. Because Abraham had a whole bunch of children. You know, he had Ishmael and he had Isaac. You remember them. And after Sarah died, he had a whole bunch more kids. Do you remember that? Genesis 25? You don't remember that. Well, he did. Ishmael had, you, you remember how many children Ishmael had? He had 12 sons. The Muslims today, they claim Ishmael as their, their father. They claim Abraham as their father through Ishmael, not Isaac. And they call their 12 tribes are the 12 tribes that come from Ishmael. Check your head like you knew that. I like it. Okay. Abraham had a whole bunch of descendants. To be the seed of Abraham, you couldn't be of any of those because God said it's Isaac, not Ishmael. So Ishmael and all his, you see, he keeps narrowing this thing down. Acts chapter 13, verse 23. And of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised up unto Israel a Savior. Now wait a minute. Whose seed is that? Verse 22, Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which hath fulfilled all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior. So it isn't just the seed of Abraham. It isn't just the seed of Isaac or Jacob. It's also going to have to be narrowed down to the seed of David. It's not even just going to be the house of Judah. It was going to be that, the tribe of Judah. But now it's got to be the seed of David. That's why Matthew chapter 1 says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So what he's doing is he's narrowing down the seed line. And what he's doing is he's, he gives you sufficient details, specific details in, in, in the Scripture so that when the Messiah shows up, you can identify him and you can have consistent, credible, factual, historical, accurate information that identifies him as being who 
He said he was. Uh, go, go back with me, if you will, to, to uh, Mark chapter number 1. Mark chapter 1. One of, the, one of the important things, get Mark chapter 1 and Malachi chapter 3. One of the important things about uh, when, when the Lord showed up is that his, he had a forerunner. He had someone who came and announced his coming before he showed up. Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I will send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now verse 3 is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 3. Behold, I will send uh, my messenger, uh, I'm sorry, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Isaiah chapter 40 prophesied that when the Messiah came, he would have some a voice in the world. You remember how we've studied that in that fifth course of judgment, when God sent Israel off into captivity, one of the reasons you have the writing prophets that we're studying back here, Hosea to Malachi, and you have Isaiah to Daniel, these prophets that wrote down books. You had hundreds and numerous prophets in Israel prior to them that never wrote anything. Elijah never wrote a book. Elisha, Elisha never wrote a book. Samuel didn't write, I mean, they, 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 they prophesied, but they didn't write books. Then you have these prophets that do write books. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think about a guy like Obadiah, and I think, Obadiah, you know, he's got a book in God's Word, <laughs> and Elijah didn't get one, didn't get to write one. And I think, I'd like to heard what Elijah would have written. I'd like to read what Elijah would have written, that kind of thing, you know. So you begin, well, why is that? Well, it's not because Obadiah is more important than Elijah was. It's because what God did in the writing prophets is he told Israel, I'm, I'm going to spend 400 years not talking to you. He talked to them through Elijah. He talked to them through Elisha. He talked to them through Samuel. He said, I'm going to spend 400 years. I'm not, I'm not going to talk to you. So I'm going to write down my message for you so you can read it when I won't talk to you. And that's what Hosea 5, the last verse there we, we, we're reading in Hosea 6, that last verse, he said, I'm going to hide my face from you. And that, 600, that 400 years of silence through there, that silence is going to be broken in the days of the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, a voice, God's going to speak again. You know what John 1 says about John the Baptist? He was a man sent from God. It's been 400 years since Israel had had a prophet like that. John the Baptist told him in John chapter 1, he says that uh, I, here's the, he, he's, the, he's the, the Son of God. How do I know? Because the one that sent me said unto me. The one you see the Holy Ghost descending on, he's the one. God the Father spoke to John and sent John. That's something, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Verse number 2 in, in Mark is a quote from Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I will send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way for me. Now go back to Malachi and look at that. Malachi 3 verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come. He's going to come while the temple's standing, even the messenger of the covenant. Whom you delight in, behold, she, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So the Messiah is going to have a forerunner. But he's going to be a very specific forerunner. Come over to Malachi chapter 4, verse number 5. Anybody could say that they're a forerunner. There used to be a guy on the radio on the t uh, years ago. Um, Herbert W. Armstrong, I don't know if you remember Herbert W. Armstrong, he's been dead for years, but uh, the Worldwide Church of God, they call themselves. It's all defunct now, but he, uh, he claimed to be the modern-day John the Baptist <laughs> and that God had given him a revelation and he's going to be John the Baptist for the Messiah. Now, the problem with that is if you read Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, and that's all you had, you might say, well, you know, he said it, you say it. And, and, but look at chapter 4, verse 5. 
Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So when he says, I'm going to send my messenger before my face to prepare the way before me, chapter 4, he tells you who that messenger is. He said, he's going to be, I'm going to send Elijah before the coming of the great and dreadful, dreadful. It isn't just going to be any messenger, any forerunner. Now come with me to Luke chapter 1. That's the reason in Luke chapter 1, when Zacharias is in the temple, and the angel Gabriel stands there and tells him, okay, Zach, you and Elizabeth are going to have a child. They, hadn't had, they were old, hadn't had kids. He said, you're going to have a child now. And his name's going to be John, and he's going to be the forerunner of the Lord. The name John is beloved of God. Look, look there at uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 13. The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy, and, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb, and, in many, of the, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go forth before him in the spirit and power of Elias. That's Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers uh, to, the, to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist is going to come in the spirit and power of who? Elijah. In fact, in Matthew 17, people ask him, said, is he Elijah or isn't he? <laughs> In other words, why would they say that? Because they know who the forerunner of the Messiah is going to be. So it wasn't just going to be anybody. There's some things, specific things in Scripture, so that when Christ comes with the proper forerunner, it'll be an exactly it'll be exactly the, the 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 thing prophesied over here, fulfilled over here. When you begin to tick off the things that get fulfilled that are prophesied over here, you're going to say, okay, it's hard, to, it's hard to miss who he is. Come back with me, if you will, to Isaiah. Get Luke chapter 4. You're in Luke chapter 4. And you can just get this. I'll just read the text here. Luke chapter 4, verse number 16. And I'll tell you what, get Isaiah chapter 61. Just, just, we're going to need Isaiah anyway in a minute. Isaiah 61, and Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse number 16. If you start in verse 14, it says, Jesus returned in the, in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Notice he's going to begin his ministry in Galilee. And that's going to be important in a minute. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. He's been, out in the, he's been out in the wilderness being tempted of the devil, the first 13 verses. Now he returns in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Now the reason that's emphasized is verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's Isaiah. And when he had opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to the minister and sat down in the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now you think about that. He's saying, I'm the one Isaiah was talking about. 
And what did Isaiah say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to present the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Christ is presenting himself as the answer to all the problems that Israel has. And he said, I have this anointing from the Holy Spirit. And you think, what's happened? He just left the bat, been baptized, the Spirit fallen on him. He just went out in the wilderness, is tempted of the devil. He comes out of, the, out of that wilderness in the power of the Spirit of God, and he goes into the synagogue and he says, I have this special anointing of the Holy Spirit that Isaiah 61 said that the Messiah would have. And then he goes about his life demonstrating that he has that. Come with me, if you will, to Acts. Hold, hold on here. Come to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Peter's going to explain some things to Cornelius here. Verse number 36, Acts 10, 36, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of, of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee. And again, notice, his ministry begins in Galilee. And that's, I'll get to pass in a minute, that's going to be important. After the baptism which John preached, now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Notice that God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost. That's what he's saying back over there in Luke 4 at the beginning of his ministry. Peter now, after his ministry, after he's ascended back to heaven, the Holy Spirit's come on the day of Pentecost in your 10 chapters in the book of Acts. Peter's explaining, hey, that one, Jesus is the one that the prophet said we're going to be anointed with this special anointing of the Holy Ghost, and God anointed him. Now, what Isaiah had said would happen happen in the person of Christ. Now go back to Isaiah and come to chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. When he comes with that anointing, Isaiah 35 verse 1, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and, the bl and, and blossom as the rose, and whose it, it shall blossom abundantly, and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be upon, uh, upon it, and the excellency of Carmel and, and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands, and comfort the feeble knees. Say to them that are fear of, of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Now when he comes to save them, what happens? Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall, shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. When they see the lame walk, the blind see, the, the deaf hear, and, and the, the mute speak, what did that tell them? Who did it tell them had showed up? Well, it says, your God shall come. And when he shall come, here are the miracles. Now come with me to Matthew chapter 11. When John the Baptist wondered about whether Jesus was really who he said he was, the Lord didn't get mad at him. He says, remember what, what, remember what you saw. Remember what Isaiah 35 told you would happen when, 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 the, when, when, when the Messiah showed up. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. By the way, to understand this passage, you've got to remember where John is. John's in jail. 
You remember how John got in jail? Well, you don't remember that? You should go back and discover that sometime. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> there, there, was a, there was a conniving female that talked Herod into putting him in jail, finally cut his head off because he stood up against the sinfulness that was going on in the government that was running Israel. So he's, he's thrown in jail. He hears the works of Christ. Verse 3, he said unto them, Art thou he that cometh, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Go tell him the words that you hear and the works that you see done, because the words that I'm preaching are the right words, and the works are the right works that validate. Luke chapter 80 says, Jesus went and preached and showed the kingdom of God. They didn't just preach it. They could demonstrate the works. The blind could see, the deaf could hear, the mute could speak, the lame could walk. What did that tell you? Verse 5, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whoso shall not be offended in me. You see, John the Baptist's problem was <laughs> he was offended. He's in jail. If he's the forerunner of the Messiah, what do you think the do you think the forerunner of the Messiah is going to wind up in, in, in the pokey? No, you'd think he's going to, you know, he, you'd get him out. And he that John had a problem understanding the timing of things, just like a lot of people had understood the timing elements in, in, in these things. And Jesus said, you want, to, you want to be sure to know who I am, look at what I'm doing. I've got this anointing that the Spirit of God says he's going to be on the Messiah, and I can demonstrate it by doing the works, the miracles, that identify me as exactly who I say that I am. Okay? I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to just keep belaboring that. I, but the point is that all of these activities that he does as he comes are designed to demonstrate who he is. Come, come back with me to Psalm 69. He fulfills specifically, I love that verse in, in Acts chapter 3, when Peter says to Israel, those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Everything the prophet said that he would do, he's done specifically and completely. And you've got Psalm 69, get a hold of that, and, 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 and John 19. Psalm 69 in one hand, John 19. Psalm 69 and Psalm 19. I did that backwards. Psalm 69 and John 19, okay? <laughs> psalm 69, this is a psalm, by the way, about, it's called the Reproach Psalm. And there are passage after passage in this psalm. It's, it's, one of, it's what's called a messianic psalm. Uh, some... A few years ago, I taught on a Sunday night a series of, of studies of teachings on the Messianic Psalms. And the, the Psalms that predict the Messiah, uh, they literally are Psalms that, that where the Messiah himself is talking. You know Psalm 22 is probably the one that's easiest to know about. The Psalm 22, the, the first verse says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you know that you, that's one of the, 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 the cries of Christ from the cross. Uh, every time Jesus spoke, by the way, from the cross, he was quoting Scripture. And uh, over and over again, when he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he's quoting Psalm 31, verse 5. He, the Psalms, you hear, you hear the Messiah speak. Now, what, what, what the Psalms do is they, they, they show you how that the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah, became so completely identified with the sufferings of his people especially the tribulation remnant, that he can speak their language. And so over and over you, you see that. 
and, and psalms that are called messianic psalms are psalms that are specifically very clearly identified in the New Testament scriptures as the, the Messiah speaking. This psalm is one of them. For example, if you look down in verse number uh, 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren, an alien unto my mother's children. Now, if you go back to John 7 and Matthew 13, you'll discover that the Lord Jesus Christ, his own brothers, his own family members, and you, you, you remember that Mary had more children than just Jesus. He was the firstborn, but he, he had at least four other brothers and, and, and two, two sisters. Uh, Mary had at least seven children, all total. But his own family members didn't believe on him, just like that verse said. Come down with me to verse number 20. 20. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I look for some to take pity, but there is none. And com for comforters, but I found none. Now if you look around the cross, you'll see exactly that happen. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Notice there are two times that they give Christ something to drink. First time they give him gall, and the second time they give him vinegar. And in the Bible, gall is a, is a sedative. In the, in the White Earp movie, one of the Earp's wife kept taking laudanum, which was a painkiller, uh, a narcotic, to, 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 to stop some pain. Well, gall is that kind of thing. Come with me to Matthew chapter 20. Oh. 27. Get Matthew 27 in one hand and Mark chapter 15. And hang on to John 19. Matthew 27 and Mark 15. There's a, there's a fascinating thing that takes place in here. Matthew 27, verse 34, verse 33. And when they were come unto the place called Golgotha, that is to play, say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he tasted thereof, he would not drink. Now if you come over to Mark 15, verse 22 and 23, it will help you with that. And they bring, they bring him, Mark 15, verse 22, they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull, and they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh. But he received it not. Now the wine mingled with myrrh, it compares with the vinegar mingled with gall. What they're talking about there is they gave him a sedative. If you go back to Proverbs chapter 31, you'll read uh, about when, when somebody is dying, you'd give him wine to drink with some sedative in it for a painkiller. But in that passage in Proverbs 31, verse 5 to 7, that says that, the, verse 4 of that passage says, uh, For thou, King Lemuel, wine and strong drink are not for you. And so when they give Christ the sedative to try to dull the pain of the crucifixion, and to dull the mental and, and, and emotional and physical agony, he won't take it. They gave it to him, but he didn't take it. They did exactly what the psalm said they would do. But then he said, the psalm 69 says, then they gave him vinegar and he did drink. We'll come over to Psalm, to John 19. And th this is one of the most... <laughs> Fascinating verses in all this, in, 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 when I read these, the, these verses, these verses right here in John 19 just blow me away. John 19, verse 28. After this, John, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. 
notice that the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that all things were now accomplished, comma, on that cross he had complete total uh, uh, possession of his mental faculties. He's gone through in his mind all the things that the Scripture have said that needed to be accomplished in his life and in his death. And he knows that all of the details of Scripture, many of which you and I wouldn't know were there until after they're there, frankly, after, after they happened. You would never take Psalm 31 verse 5 and, and say that was, that was the Messiah until after he did it. You'd never take Psalm 41 verse 9 when he talks about my own familiar friend that kicked up his heel against me and say that's Judas until afterward. Those are kind of hidden kind of prophecies that afterward you look back and say, oh yeah, that's what that is. <laughs> well, that's just kind of hidden. But Christ knew what it was, what, what it was, and he knew that everything had been accomplished. Therefore he said, I thirst. Now why did he say, I thirst? Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. There was one thing that hadn't been finished. Psalm 69, verse 21, part B. He knew they'd given him the gall with the vinegar, the wine and the, and the myrrh. He knew they'd get, and he knew that's what they, and he didn't take it. But he knew there was another thing that needed to be done. They needed to give him the vinegar by itself. And he knew everything else had been fulfilled. One verse. And he says, I thirst to motivate them to do exactly what that verse said. Now when I read that, I think, you know, for someone dying in the agony, the abuse, the emotional abuse, the rejection, much less just the pure physical agony. I can understand why he would have rejected the, the narcotics. <laughs> having just gone through surgery and having been given a bunch of narcotics, they make the walls crawl and birds fly out of your wife's hair and all kind of goofball things that happen to you, you know. Why? To try to negate the pain. Last week I had a uh, procedure at the hospital and I went in and I'm laying there on the table and the lady's going to put the medicine in the IV and she says, I'm going to say goodbye to you because we won't see you again until the recovery room when your wife is there. And they put this stuff in me and she was right. Next thing I knew there, my wife was looking at me and said, Ricky, wake up, wake up. <laughs> About an hour and a half later, it's called amnesia drug. You don't go to sleep. It's what they call, they, they call it twilight you. But you're unconscious. Jesus, he didn't want to go through any of that. He wanted to be conscious. He, verse 30 says that he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He, he wasn't, he was erect and conscious and in full capacity of his faculties, mental and physical. He died willingly on purpose fulfilling exactly what Scripture said he would do. Numbered with the transgressors, exactly like the Scripture said he, he would be, and so forth. In fact, if you keep reading down there, you'll notice in verse 34 and 35 that they come by and he's already dead. They don't break his legs. They pierce his side. And why do they don't break his legs but pierce his side? Verse 36, these things were done that the Scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him should not be broken. And another Scripture saith, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. So even after his death, the next set of Scriptures are being fulfilled. My point to you in all this is, when you read in Hosea 6, he's going to come. And then you've got to read all those details. Listen, all the details about the second coming, you can trust them because you have a historical record that all of these specific little minor sounding details about his first coming are fulfilled exactly.
right on the money, exactly like you said they would be. And the record is there to validate it. So trusting the second coming is nothing but just the continuation of the factual historical reality that God's Word is true. And I've said to you before, uh, in fact, let's just close with this, Isaiah 41. Verse number 21. Isaiah 41, verse 21. Here's the God of the Bible talking to all the other gods, pretentious gods, all the other religions of the world. You know, we, we live in an era right now in our country where America is becoming like the rest of the world. For several hundred years, our country has had the witness of, uh, of a Christianized culture. You could go anywhere else in the, on the, in the world outside of America and most of Europe, and all of the gods of the nations are there. I've walked the streets through the Middle East, and I, I, I mean the uh, 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 streets of Asia. I've walked through streets in Africa, and you'll have a Buddhist temple and a, and a Muslim mosque and a Sikh temple and a, and a Hindu temple and then another Buddhist temple and a Christian church. and uh, you, All right, right down the street. That's been rare here. And it's not rare anymore. In the last 20 years, it's been completely turned on its ear. Israel lived in a world like that. And the thing about what this passage that, that's fascinating to me is that you don't need to fear that kind of a world. Because God says, bring all these different religions, sit them at the table, and I'll prove to you that I'm right and they're wrong. Whoa. Well, here's how he does it. Verse 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the, God, the king of, of, of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them bring forth the former things which they be, uh, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them and declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Now that's the divine apologetic. That's the divine challenge, is the ability to foretell the future. Fulfilled prophecy, predictive prophecy, is the way God says, you know that I'm God and everybody else isn't. Notice how he, he does the thing, the verdict in verse 24. Behold, ye are nothing, and your work of naught. An abomination is he that chooseth you. <laughs> Whoa. God says, you can't do it. I can, you can't, means you're nothing. You're not, I am. And that's a... That's a fascinating thing to see how God says, you know, let's just cut to the chase. Verse 25, I will raise up one that from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun shall he come upon, the, um, upon my name. He shall come upon the princes as, as upon mortar, and as a potter treadeth clay. Who shall declare from the beginning that they may know, and, and, and before time that we may say he is righteous? Yea, there is none that showeth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth my words. And you're going down through that thing. Come on down chapter 42 and 43. And he just keeps challenging them with it. And what he in essence says is, you know what's going to happen? When the enemy comes in, the captivity comes and takes you away. You're going to know that exactly what I said, the way I said it, it came to pass. You're going to know I'm God. And you know what happened? The historical record is it was exactly 
as it came to pass. In fact, that's one, one of the wildest things you'll ever see. Look at chapter 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. King Cyrus is named 300 years before he shows up. That's kind of sticking your neck out prophetically. And God does it, and then he shows up right on, on schedule. You can trust God's word. That's the whole point of it all. When you talk about the coming of the, of, 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 of the, uh, the Messiah, first coming or second coming, it's the predictive prophecies in Scripture that demonstrate it to be true. And consequently, what the Scripture says about it meaning will be the proper meaning to give it. Okay? All right, well, praise the Lord.